true crime artifact show and tells and i want to introduce my friend adam crutchfield i'd like to have you introduce you know a little bit about yourself and then we can get into it my name is adam crutchfield i live in tennessee i have collected true crime artifacts since roughly around the year 2007 um gone through lots of pieces over time had a lot of stuff passed through my hands bought a lot of stuff from some really good collectors out there and i've also ran into shitty people too it's kind of you know that's in any field of collecting or anywhere there's money involved but uh it's always been a big passion of mine and as i've gotten older i kind of like it more it's grown more to where um i really like the historical aspect of holding on to items that have a significance that has to do with not only our country but the world in general so uh that's kind of me i'm 40 years old and been collecting this stuff a pretty pretty good while so let's start out with talking about and showing artifacts from a individual by the name of richard speck could you give a quick rundown of his case and then, you know, show a, a couple sure. artifacts that you own? Yeah, sure. So um, Richard Speck, his full name was Richard Benjamin Speck. He was born on uh, December 6th, 1941, and he died December 5th of 1991, right before his 50th birthday. Um, Speck is an important part of criminal history because um correct me if i'm wrong but um i've always uh known him as the first publicized mass murder um story to ever be in the united states so um that that happened in 1966 on july 13th and went into the morning of july 14th he killed eight student nurses in uh, South Deering, Chicago. And uh, Corazon Amareo, I think is how you say her name, was the only surviving victim. And the only reason she survived was because she hid under a bed. The really scary part of all that shit is that um, he was taking these women, put them all in a room, secluded them. And then he was taking them one at a time into another room and uh, just stacking them pretty much. But one thing that's kind of important about that story is that he came from a long line of alcoholism before uh, that night took place, drugs and alcoholism, but mostly alcohol. And he spent a night, the night drinking very heavily. I think that I had read that he started drinking at the age of 12 and he had a stepfather, I believe, that um, was very abusive and very heavy drinker. And that's kind of like the, the seed of what really started him into, I guess, having alcohol accessible. And he lived his whole life getting as fucked up as possible, even in prison, which we can get into. But he died of a heart attack in Stateville Correctional Center. And that would, have, like I said, on December 6th of 1991 at 49 years old. Many people don't know, but Richard Speck had a daughter as well. Her name was Robbie Lynn Speck, and she was born on July 5th of 1962. And he had her with a wife, um, his, his wife, I should say, uh, Shirley Annette Malone. And they, she was only 15. At the time when she got pregnant, they married right away. Of course, his life was crazy. He was a petty thief, uh, a burglar, and spent his life always causing trouble. He's really well known for the born to raise hell tattoo that he had on his arm, which I, you know, in the 1960s, having born to raise hell on your arm was, that's pretty, uh, pretty crazy stuff. And, uh, Anyway, once he got into prison, he was not a model citizen whatsoever. He was caught all the time with uh, drugs and booze, mostly moonshine. And 
One thing that really made him stand out was that in 1996, a video surfaced that was from 1998. So this uh, anonymous attorney um, mailed this uh, videotape to, uh, I can't remember who they said that he had mailed it to. Uh, I think it was, it was someone in the criminal system showing the stuff that was going on in the prison. And in the video, there was explicit sex, drugs, um, anything that you could uh, imagine going on crazy in a prison. It was going on. And right in the middle, this was this was in the Stateville prison, too, uh, which is where he was located. And in the middle of all this um, video, there was Richard Speck and he was way off his rocker on uh doing cocaine and drinking and they at one point in the video he was giving oral sex to a fellow prisoner and uh he was sharing a very large pile of cocaine that they had and he was wearing silk panties with his breast exposed which he was taking hormones in prison to become a woman so another aspect of that case that's kind of crazy is that he was the first like transgendered prisoner that was really uh you know that's kind of a significant thing and uh anyway he died when he died um in 1991 his sister ended up with his body and she was so worried about people vandalizing wherever he would be buried at that she ended up having him cremated and she took him to Joliet, Illinois, and scattered his ashes in an unknown location. So there is no more Richard Speck. He blew away in the wind. There's There's been a story that's been told over the years. I believe it was a, a sparrow or a crow or something like that. Do you know this story of, of when the, the prison guards were trying to take it away from him? Yeah, so we had two of them. And they were sparrows and uh, he had, they nicknamed him in prison Birdman too, like the Birdman of Alcatraz. And the reason he gained that nickname is he had these two birds that pretty much lived in his cell with him. So I imagine that, you know, they had the open bars open to the outside and he was probably feeding them crumbs and stuff, but they kept coming back to him. So he had two pet birds, you know, and uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy, man, that he was, he literally had two pet birds, but I did read that. I never did really figure out if he, if he was ever, if they took him or if he was, if they just kind of left him alone and, and let the birds hang out with him. But it is pretty neat that, you know, in the middle of all this, that he did have two wild birds, you know, fly into his prison cell and they would come and go, apparently pretty crazy. You know, I mean, he was a loose cannon and he he said you know, he it's he had some sort of empathy um, when he was on trial. He, he said he was sorry, you know, but like in the video where um, he's doing blow with these other guys and stuff, they, they mentioned it, you know, and you can actually look that up on YouTube. But they ask him, you know, like, hey, uh, uh you know, what about the girls you killed? And he was, he said, it was just their day, you know? So he never really, he never really had any kind of like real remorse. I think he was just a, a very uh, strange individual that um, took his aggression out on everyone. You have some artifacts um, from Speck right there, right? I do. And the thing about Speck, you know as well as I do, and I actually bought the letter set from you, you know, several years ago. But um, the thing about Speck is he's extremely hard to uh, to get, and um, I'm happy with just having the letter set. The reason I say that is because I've always heard, and I believe it, that um, that his paintings were never really actually done by him. You know that. Um, he just signed them and mailed them off. And I've seen some of his stuff that it just looks way too good to be true. Um, now, he has some paintings out there that are really cool, you know, uh, like his abstract stuff. 
um, which is really neat. But even then, I don't really, I don't really know how much of that I believe that he could have the the mind capacity to like, you know, put forth into art because it seemed to me like his whole story, he was just so scattered all over the place, you know? And uh, obviously he was dealing with his own demons at all times, you know? So I think that it's not way too far-fetched to say that he could have, he could have been creating art in there, but personally for me, it's like, it's just one of those things I don't want to spend thousands of dollars on. And then feel like I'm not really like, you know, it could have been done by another inmate. He just signed it. So, yeah, but I have some stuff here. So we will check them out. Hold on. Let me flip this angle. And uh, I'll briefly go over it. <clears throat> so this, which I'll hold it up. So there we go. So this is a you know, big frame piece I have of this letter. And um, like I said, it came from you. So um, I remember when you got it, I had asked if you ran into spec to let me know. And, you know, when you did get it, I, I uh, bothered you and bothered you to say, hey, man, sell it to me. And then eventually you're like, all right, I'll sell it. So, um this is it. So this is the original Saturday Evening Post from July 1st of 1967. There is a huge section of it um, that was dedicated just to this case. And I imagine that in 1967, this was fucking crazy. You know, um, I mean, this is like Texas Chainsaw Massacre type stuff. And, you know, one thing that we we didn't mention in the beginning is the style of his murders uh, kind of stood out because they were so bad. Um, he strangled. He also stabbed. Uh, he beat him. You know, it was just horrific freaking crime, you know. And uh, this is an original press photo from when he was arrested. This was um, right when he first got arrested. Uh, the, these, these original photos are cool. I have a book full of them of, of different cases. Uh, I buy them here and there and, uh, I've always liked them. Can you, can you talk about what exactly a press photo is? Cause I imagine there's a lot of people that have no idea what, what a press right. photo is. So a, pre a press photo is an original photo that was taken from a photographer and then they are sold to you know, whatever tabloid that they're giving them to. So what they do is they'll dress them up and um, try to sell them. And, and these newspapers and stuff would buy them. And, and the cool thing about them is they, they pop up because over time, these newspapers and tabloids, they get rid of them just because they have just an, an overwhelming uh, amount of them so they'll they'll sell them off at auctions and stuff like that and people will buy up you know a big huge lot of them and most of the time when you find when you find uh you know press photos you might be buying one of a an old case of a serial killer but in the same huge lot you know there's farmers and you know just everyday stuff because it's it's literally like they sell off sections of like whole years, you know? And so it's like anything and everything that got put into a magazine is what they'll be getting rid of. So they're, they're fun to get. They're relatively cheap. You can find press photos on eBay that are legit. You know, um, a lot of times the, the backs of them will have um, where it'll show where the, the photo is from. A lot of times they'll have the actual uh, article put into the side of it. So you can see like on this one. Um, but this, while we're talking about press photos, this is another one of spec. And this one's from a February 20th, which I imagine would have been in 1968. And it says, 
Speck arrives center and escorted from police van by Periora Piora police today as he arrives uh, at the county court house for opening of the trial in which he is charged with the slaying of eight nurses in Chicago last July. So yeah, that would have definitely been in, in 68 February. And that's, so that's, that's kind of a cool one. And then another press photo that I have pertaining to this case, this is the only surviving victim that he had that we talked about earlier. Um, her name is hard to, hard to pronounce, but the Corazon Amareu, which sounds like Hawaiian or something, but um, this right here, this is the actual article that it went to. So slaughtered survivor, slaughter survivor to wed. So she was 25 years old, lone living witness to a 1966 massacre of eight fellow nurses in Chicago by Richard Speck. We'll marry, you know, whatever the guy's name is today at her home in San Luis and the somewhere in the Philippines. So yeah, it's crazy. So with that being 66, that means that this one was from 67. Now that I'm thinking about it more, but on to the letter. This is pretty neat. It says, let me see if I can put this up a little better. I received your letter today and to answer it, my mother died two years ago and that was the only money I had coming in was from her and had around $240 worth of stuff, books, paint, canvas, and every color of oil paint you could think of. I needed a TV, a TV, a razor. Um, it says, oh, shit. I needed a TV. It's so hard to read his writing. I needed a TV a year ago. My mind went out. He, he's like illiterate too. That's another thing. Like he's not saying mine went out. It says my went out and he's spelling went, W-H-E-N-T. So I sold all of it for $150 to get another TV. Yes, I did oil painting, wildlife, still life, uh, American art. Uh, black art and what pictures I look at and like I did then but right now Mr. Zondell don't have any money to do any paintings I make $30 a month and here painting the prison and I use that for cigarettes coffee soap and shampoo and stuff like that and $30 don't go very far other than that I would love to do a painting, um, but right now I don't have anything to work with. I sorry, and it's spelled sorry, S-O-R-R-I-E, could not help you out on that, Richard Speck. So obviously he's begging for money <laughs> right here. Um, and this is another one of those things where, you know, he says he's doing paintings, but I, I kind of have a feeling that he probably was just kind of commissioning that off to someone that could actually put paint on a canvas. I'm, I don't know that for any fact, but um, a lot of the paintings I've seen are just like really good, you know, um, they're really well put together. And just given his, um, the way he was as a person, it just seems kind of hard to imagine that he would have had the patience to sit down and actually paint. Um, another piece that I have right here, which is really significant, is the night that Speck committed the murders, he spent his time at this bar, and it was called Kay's Pilot House. And Kay's Pilot House um, was located at 3500 East 100th Street, Chicago, Illinois. And it says here, stolen from Mrs. C. Erickson, which is kind of funny I found this on eBay just because of the case I had saved case pilot house in a search 
And when this thing popped up, man, I think I got it for like 20 bucks. So it was crazy. It was just no, it, as soon as the, the murders happened and it all came out that he drank so much, they, they ended up shutting the doors. And so that was kind of the demise of that business was Richard Speck's case because uh, people were really irritated. People said that they saw him and that he was belligerent and they just kept feeding him drinks. And uh, they ended up getting, getting a lot of scrutiny over that. Um, so it's, it's a pretty significant piece because, you know, there's a chance he smoked cigarettes like a freight train. There's a chance that uh, he could have used this ashtray um, the night before he, or the night that he did that, um, which is kind of cool. The last thing is not an actual um, true crime artifact, but it's pretty neat. And I thought I would show it. Uh, so several years ago, I met this, uh, this older man in his seventies and he retired and he started 3d printing and I, he, he did the Ed Gein house and I messaged him and was like, man, that is, that's really cool. I bought one and I told him you should do other cases. And he asked me, well, what other cases would you like? So I mentioned several of them. And one of them that he did and he sent to me was the Richard Speck murder house. And you know, because you've been there, Andrew, that uh, there's not much to that place. No. There's uh, not. Yeah, it's kind of like a really small little shithole, you know. And uh, so uh, I thought it was really cool. Um made me several of these i have probably 10 or 11 different crime scenes that he's made for me different houses and different places where stuff has happened and uh i just thought it was kind of cool you know it's worth uh adding it to the video just to just to show that uh it's pretty neat and he's on etsy he probably still has some of these for sale his name is a uh, we rail fan which is w-i-r-a-i-l-f-a-n so if you look that up there's there's uh quite a few of different crime scenes that he has done uh simply because i asked him to do them and he made you know uh several or, or a lot of different multiples of these 3d printings and uh they're cool man if you're if you're into collecting true crime you know they kind of add a little flavor to um to any collection so definitely worth looking into so so i'll ask you what what i've been asked over the years you know se seems like almost every week now but so why would somebody collect something like that let alone pay say two three thousand dollars from something from somebody that's you know killed a bunch of women or whatever right and that's a that's a relevant question you know when people ask me that i i don't take offense to it i don't like because I understand that, that it's a really touchy subject. And for me, it has always 100% been the historical aspect, the significance, the impact that it had on American culture, you know? So for instance, you know, Ted Bundy, um, Dennis Rader, BTK, a lot of these, a lot of those guys from those eras of, crime you know they had police on pins and needles gary ridgeway is a perfect example of that um because they knew ridgeway was guilty but they couldn't pin him to it because he was so good at covering up you know and so without that history the the criminal the criminal uh um aspect of all of it would not be nothing to what it is today. Forensics, DNA, you know, it's come so far now. And, and it's, also a, it's also a seesaw because it's great on one end. Then on another end, you know, you could be at the wrong place at the wrong time and your DNA end up on something and you could get, you could be fucked on that, you know? So I've, I've always just strictly collected for the historical aspect. I know that there have been people that I've, I've come across in the years of collecting that are almost weird, like uh, serial killer groupies or something, you know, and um, I've never had that. Uh, I've never had that feeling. I've never thought that any of them were 
were cool per se. Um, but I think the cases are freaking uh, unbelievably, uh, um, unbelievably interesting. You know what I mean? And I would say that one that I did think was pretty cool was Manson. <laughs> but uh, it's just because the whole story was just sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And, and uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, there's so much to, to make out of that story, you know. And, but, you know, all these cases I've collected and spent lots of money on, um, I really just like preserving parts of criminal history that are significant, you know. I don't really care about the stuff that's, uh, that's real small cases. I, I like the things that um, just have a significance. If it has a significance, then, then I like it, whether it be the mob or whether it be a serial killer, or whether it be a, a scandal, you know, I like all of it. If it had an impact on on American uh, society, which when you talk to people and you and you you tell them, yeah, I mean, I would love to find uh, you know something from Columbine or something like that. People think you're you're crazy, you know. Um, like right now, if if I could find a letter from uh, Nick Cruz of the Parkland massacre, you know, obviously I'd want to buy it, you know? And uh, so it's just hard. It's hard to ever explain that. But here's the thing is like, you know, 50 years, a hundred years down the road, all this stuff is going it, to, it's already happening with Gacy and Bundy and Manson, you know, for the longest time, they act, the country was just like, don't even talk about that. You know, those are terrible parts, dark parts of American history. But over time, they become more of a, it's almost like a, a fable because the people that are involved or were involved in it, they're, they're all dead and gone or they're dying off. And the newer generations of people, it's nothing but a story. So you have the, the cases like Ed Gein or Albert Fish that, as we know, as as young collectors, you know, so 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 called young collectors, that's just a story to us, you know. And so as time progresses, all of these these atrocities are going to continue to become stories or fables, like Hansel and Gretel. And yeah, they really ha happened and they were terrible pieces of American history, but everyone that was involved in it, they're dead and gone. So there's no connection there from the listener to the story. There's there, there ends up being no connection there, you know? So then at that point, it's just, um, people just say, Oh, I want to hear more about how crazy this was, you know? Yeah. And speaking of, you know, fables, just American, you know, in general, you got, you know, the the Zodiac Killer, John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, Richard Ramirez, Eileen Warnos, and, you know, so many others, you know, throughout time, even going back to, you know, the Texarkana Phantom and, and you know, so many days yeah. back in, in time. I, I learned about a, a a serial killer, one of America's first serial killers in Austin, Texas, called the Austin uh, Annihilator Girl Killer. And I had no idea about this until I looked into this, you know, a uh, uh, murder walk tour. It's crazy, man. And growing up, um, you know, you talk about the, uh, the Phantom Killer, the Texarkana murders. Uh, uh, I, I was like obsessed with that. Even as a kid, you know, I watched the, the town that dreaded sundown, which was made in like 78 or 77. And my mom was always a fan of that movie. She really liked that movie. My mom has always been like my sidekick on true crime stuff because she's always been really fascinated with with all of the, all of the same stuff I have. But uh, I remember watching the town the dreaded sundown, and even though that 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 movie's pretty cheesy, you know, um, still it was the the fact that this guy did all this and then he didn't get caught, and it was just this real scary. Like where is he now, you know, and. Uh, so yeah, I mean that's exactly you're exactly right. It's the it's it's crazy because oh you know it all, over time all of this stuff 
it becomes like real deep rooted folklore in, in America. It's, it's real stuff that happened, but as it gets further and further out past the time it happened, it'll become nothing more than a story. And, uh, you know, that's terrible to say too, because there's so many lives impacted from all these cases. But when you, whenever the media makes such a speculation over anything that has to do with a, a criminal act, anytime they make such a big deal out of it, that's exactly what it's going to become. You know, it, it brands itself and it never goes away. I mean, look at, you know, Manson stuff. It, that will never go away. A hundred years from now, it'll still be a story. There will still be a TV show. I mean, if TVs are still around a hundred years from now, there will still be stuff that is going to be exclusively talking about those crimes because it's, it's, that's what it is, man. It's going to always be there.